Arizona, and I'm a professor of philosophy at St. Anselm College, and also the executive director of the college's Center for Ethics in Business and Governance. For those of you joining us today who are new to the center, the center is in its third year at the college and has for its mission to address important ethical issues in our organizations and communities, and to do so through research, education, dialogue, and collaboration. So welcome again to all of you. Today's program is an ethics and governance forum entitled A Culture Built on Trust. As many of you may know, one of the topics that is a reoccurring and central theme in our work at the center is corporate governance and corporate culture. Today's event will explore the element of culture as a key asset of a corporation and how a culture built on trust can begin to be developed. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to, um, to take care of my duties. By state law, I'm required to advise all of you who are attending this webinar that this webinar is being recorded. Now, fortunately, we are joined in today's discussion by several experts on these matters of corporate culture and corporate governance. Uh, experts who will be introduced by my colleague, Dina Frutos Benzi. Dina is an associate professor of international business at St. Anselm College and has 10 years of corporate professional experience as a human resources manager and training and development manager, both in Europe and the United States. Uh, Dina will be the moderator for today's discussion and I now turn it over to her. Dina. Thank you, Max. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm seen, but that's okay. Uh, so good afternoon. It's an honor to moderate today's panel on such an important topic with such distinguished experts. So please allow me to introduce our speakers. Lawrence Cunningham is an authority on corporate governance, corporate culture, and corporate law, and teaches business-related courses that span these fields. He is currently on the board of Constellation Software, Inc. In the nonprofit sector, he is a trustee of the Museum of American Finance, a Smithsonian affiliate, member of the Dean's Council of Lerner College of Business of the University of Delaware, and a member of the editorial board of Financial History, the magazine of the Museum of American Finance. He's also a prolific author. He's a regular columnist for the NACD Directorship Magazine and the recipient of the NACD's 2018 B. Kenneth West Lifetime Achievement Award. Ellen Richstone is a former Fortune 500 CFO and CEO of a private company. She has been a public company board director since 2003, currently sitting on three public company boards. Ellen also sits on the board of the National Association of Corporate Directors, that is NACD, New England, and is a NACD Board Leadership Fellow, the highest governance level awarded. So without further ado, let's begin our discussion. But before that, I mean, I do have a, a series of prepared questions, but if you have any questions, Please make sure you use the Q&A feature in Zoom. It will be at the bottom of your screen and please type in your questions. We will have time at the end of, of this discussion, sort of Q, uh, our, you know, our, our questions here for your questions. So I'll remind you again, uh, probably later, to use that Q&A feature for your questions. So each of you is known for, experience in, for your experience in leadership and governance. So Larry, let me begin with you. Can you share with us your insights on what is needed to promote a culture of trust inside a corporation, whether public or private or nonprofit? Does your view differ if this is a large global company versus a company with a few locations and a clear central corporate hub? Well, uh, thanks, Dana. And I'd just first like to express my thanks to the center for hosting this webinar today and having Ellen and me and, and, and the rest of the team here. Uh, and thanks to all of our uh, participants. Um, I hear there's a very large number. And so we're very grateful for the opportunity to have a chat. Uh, my answer, Dana, to that one is um, tone at the top plus. 
we hear a lot about tone at the top and it's certainly important how CEOs and board members present their companies, whether they emphasize employees first, shareholders first or, or something else. Um, and, and culture and particularly a trust-based culture is, is the same. The CEO needs to set that tone. But I say plus because he's, he or she also has to live it, has to model it, has to demonstrate that that's the, uh, the, the culture of, of the organization, that that's a very important value. And I, I came to this conclusion through a uh, journey that began uh, uh, 25 years ago in my studies of Berkshire Hathaway, which is, I think, a company that epitomizes the, the culture of trust. Now, the first uh, work that I did on this was called The Essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America. I, I think it's pictured there on, on the uh, screen if it's, if it's still being presented. Uh, and it was interesting, I first published that in 1996 when the company was mostly an investment vehicle. So it didn't have much management, didn't really need a particular culture. It just bought large uh, positions in public companies. And the most important lessons back then were investment lessons. And the number one investment lesson Warren had to teach was the uh, so called the margin of safety, an assertion that um, investors should only make an investment when the price they pay is way less than the value they receive. Uh, he viewed this situation as extremely unusual. And so when it occurred or when people found it, he encouraged them to load up. However, the next 20, 25 years, the company morphed into a conglomerate, which uh, where its, its assets are, consist almost 80% or so of, in, of uh, businesses that are operated by managers. He's got 80 plus businesses. And he began to talk then about management principles and he began to talk about corporate culture and he began to talk about trust. Uh, about 10 years ago after he turned 80 and people worried about what would happen to Berkshire Hathaway after Warren left the scene, he said, well, the company will survive because of its culture. He didn't really elaborate exactly what that meant and so I did. Uh, in my next book, Berkshire Beyond Buffett, pictured there on the left of the screen, I evaluate and, and assess Berkshire's culture. I called it the enduring value of values because it involved things like honesty, candor, loyalty, self-reliance. Uh, and I was privileged to present that book here at the center uh, on, on the book tour. And I'm forever grateful for Ann and, and the team for hosting it. In the past six years, I've continued to study what this culture means. And I've tried to boil it down to three words, just like he said, the margin of safety is the most important investment lesson. I decided margin of trust is the most important management lesson to take from Berkshire Hathaway. So just as margin of safety is about how rare it is to find a big price value difference and to load up when you do, margin of trust means it's, it's rare to find a thoroughly trustworthy person to whom you can delegate all responsibility. But when you do, you should delegate as much as possible to them. And that's been the secret of Berkshire Hathaway's success. If you turn the slide, it has acquired 80 plus different businesses that now generate revenue of $250 billion, employ some 400,000 people, uh, and are in every artery of industry and operating in almost every country in the world. And yet it's headquarters in Omaha has 16 people in it. <laughs> I mean, there's the, it doesn't even have an organization chart, uh, but if it did, that's what it would look like. You've got Buffett there at the top uh, a board and, and 17 uh, staff in Omaha and, and six officers. Okay, he's 23 people in Omaha. That's it. Uh, he's got two investment in, in managers there uh, pictured on the left. Everything else is delegated down. All Decisions about marketing, inventory, HR, tech, and everything else is handled down at the individual business units. It is an extraordinary uh, autonomous uh, organization with virtually no internal controls or policies or procedures. Virtually everything is based on trust. Uh, so... It's an extraordinary business model. Uh, and the, the next question I asked myself was, is it unique? Uh, and as I'll, if, if Ann will turn to the next slide, it's not. And I think Ellen will speak to this shortly. Berkshire Hathaway is an exemplar of this trust-based culture, and Warren has lived and breathed it. 
Uh, but the next slide will show that dozens of other companies, large and small, and sector and, and the for-profit sector, uh, have embraced this model. And here, here's just uh, eight uh, notable examples. And if Q&A allows, I'd be happy to talk about uh, any, any given one of them. But I, 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 I enter this slide, and I think Ellen's going to speak to this too, because the idea of, of trusting people, of a culture that's based on a high degree of, of mutual trust and, and reciprocity and delegation uh, is possible at, at companies large and small. Uh, but, but it does require that that CEO live the model. And, and Warren has just briefly give you the best example, a single example I can give you where Warren has lived that for 25 years. It, it, it originated at Solomon Brothers in 1994. Uh, that was an investment bank of the era in which Berkshire held a 20% preferred stock interest. Several bankers engaged in criminal uh, cornering of the bond market. And apparently uh, there were some other rogues in, in the organization and the company uh, was under enormous regulatory and public pressure to do something. And what they did is fired that group, uh, took out the CEO, and asked Warren Buffett to become CEO. Uh, and he, he stepped into that role reluctantly for about a year and a half. Uh, he was called to Congress to testify about what he was going to do. Uh, and this is what he told Congress. And he later told his, his team. He said, I'm going to tell them, lose money for the firm, even a lot of money, and I'll be understanding lose reputation for the firm, even a shred of reputation, and I'll be ruthless. And I can give you examples later, later on of what, what ruthlessness means in this context, but that spine-tingling oratory certainly set the tone at the top at Berkshire 25 years ago, and he's lived that, and his team has ever since. So that's where, um, that's, that's my ultimate answer, Dina, to, to your question, mm -hmm. is that, that that leadership has to say it, believe it, and act on it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So uh, now I'm going to turn to Ellen, kind of building up on this. And Ellen, can you talk about why the culture of a company impacts it so much and why boards should think seriously about it? Sure. So I'm coming mostly from the board perspective in this conversation. So let's start for a second where uh, the board's role in a public company, the board of directors role in the public company. We all know they're voted in by the shareholders, but we also need to think about the fiduciary responsibilities that those that board of directors has, which is usually focused in on what's referred to as duty of care and duty of loyalty. So what does that mean? It means that the board of directors needs to ask questions in good faith, um, be careful, be diligent, think about things, provide appropriate oversight, make sure disclosures are, are, are dealt with appropriately. But the undercore here is, is really, um, they need to think in terms of the best interests of the company. So they really need to think about what's right for the company and the shareholders on a long-term basis. Now we could have that conversation of short-term versus long-term, but they need to focus in on the best interests of the company. So where's the intersection between that comment and culture? Well, first let's talk about values and mission. So when a CEO talks or when a board talks, they usually start with, here's the mission of the company, here's the vision of the company, and here are our values. What the mission and vision and values are, they are what I would call the what and the why of an organization. But the challenge is, is that you can spout anything at that top and say our mission is this, our values are that, but culture is how things happen. It's I joke about it's how the sausage made. It's actually how people do things. So culture impacts the decisions about what you do, what you don't do, and defines what an organization really considers meaningful. So it's the explicit rules, but it's the implicit rules. It's the norms of behavior and interaction about what actually happens. 
It's compliance, but it's also the core ethics behind it. It's how we do our recruiting and training. Are we inclusive? How do we make our decisions? How do we communicate internally? How do we disagree internally? How do we communicate externally? It's leadership styles. One of the things that I have absolutely come to the conclusion on is there's no one right culture, but there are core underpinnings um, that are very important, which start with, of course, ethics and integrity. But having said that, different companies at different stages can have different kinds of cultures. There are cultures that might, um, you know, spark, you know, technology innovation. There are others that are just focused around quality and safety. Um, but the, the point here is that culture is absolutely critical because it's how a company gets things done. It's how it solves problems. And how is how it makes choices. So let me give you a couple stories that I think are worth thinking about. So one is you've got a company who public company under pressure to perform financially, and let's assume it's revenue, operating margin, and earnings. So what happens if a company has to choose between quality, spending money and quality and safety versus getting the product out and making their numbers for the quarter? The answer is you can tell a lot about a company on choices they make along those lines. I mean, I'll give you an example from earlier this year. One of my companies um, was during the pandemic, of course, during the heat of the pandemic, um, was told they weren't allowed, even though they were in a hot zone, they weren't allowed to stop producing because they made a high tech product that went into the military. Even though, honestly, I would have said you could pause, but the government would not let the company pause. They insisted on the delivery, said they were essential. And so the board with management, management with the board, um, spent a lot of time saying, okay, they don't want us to stop producing. We're in a hot zone. How are we going to make sure we keep our people safe? huge amount of focus around how do we keep our people safe? And it wasn't until we got to a po that point and by the way, we ended up with nobody, nobody, even in a hot zone, nobody with um, testing positive for COVID. But we went to extraordinary lengths to make sure what we did, we did everything we could possibly do to keep our people safe. Again, it, the culture was around the people. Another example from a different angle would be, um, and this one I saw a few times, uh, in prior companies, not, not the companies I'm with now, on the board of now, where you had, say, a top salesman, your top salesman guy who just beats his numbers every year. And all of a sudden you learn, maybe it's through a whistleblower line, maybe it's through something else, that, that the guy is either giving bribes or in another, another case, he was writing side letters to the customer. Um, and separate side agreements. And so the question came down to, okay, are you gonna walk the talk or are you gonna let the guy get away with it? Are you gonna slap his wrist? And in the good news is in both those cases, the individual was fired. But it's very clear to the entire organization that it, and Larry mentioned this too, it's the culture is about not just what you say, it's what you do. It's how you function. It's how you live your life in a corporation. Well, I'll stop there. Thank you, Ellen. So kind of, I mean, both of you mentioned this importance of culture. Let me go back to Larry now and uh, another kind of deep, digging deeper a little bit. So Larry, your book stresses that investing in quality people is a key element of having a good culture and successful business. So if you are the CEO, how do you figure this out? It's a profoundly difficult uh, determination <laughs> to make. Some people have good intuitive skills in making a judgment about um, individual capabilities. Warren is, Buffett is, is famous for being able to size people up in very short order. I think his, the reason he's famous for that and the reason that people think he's good at it is he's got, he's got an extremely high bar. He, he, he 
trusts very few people. He, he doesn't trust banks, trusts very few lawyers. I don't think he, he certainly doesn't trust most investment managers. He doesn't trust most um, sellers of businesses. And so he comes with an extremely skeptical eye and knowing that he is going to repose enormous trust and, and delegation uh, will only uh, go into business, only hire people to this particular point, only hire people who he'd be happy to have his son or daughter marry or who he'd be happy to have as the executor <laughs> of his will. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is, is a more scientific or rigorous um, analytical way, uh, which is done at Danaher. That's one of the companies listed on that slide as uh, epitomizing a, a trust-based culture. Uh, it's very interesting that it's a trust-based culture. They have enormous uh, autonomy and delegation and, uh, and, um, and you know, people uh, have wide discretion to do a lot of things. But getting a job at Danaher is extremely difficult. Uh, the interviews in, uh, include extensive testing, personality tests, management assessment tests, uh, tests on, on the features of, of Dan or her culture. It takes weeks to go through this. And so they've got a, at least a, a basis for predicting whether a particular person is trustworthy and can handle uh, the culture that they've established. And, and this goes to Ellen's point too. Is what, both the way Warren does it and the way Danner does it tends to result in a group of people who are on the same page, who say and do the same things, who behave according to the norms, as, as Ellen put it, uh, and, and the decision-making criteria, the promotion rules, uh, uh, you know, how to avoid cutting those corners and avoid you know, focus on the quarterly numbers. So, so there are a couple of different ways to do it. One more intuitive, one more analytical and, and rigorous. Um, but, it, and if you succeed in doing it, you will begin to get a uh, self-propagating culture that if you make a mistake, you accidentally hire a, a deviant person. I mean, deviant from your norms and your culture. They'll, they'll, that will soon be discovered either by that person in the lead or uh, the firm itself uh, counseling them out or, or, or worse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to remind again the audience that uh, towards the end of this session, uh, we're going to have a Q&A, uh, you know, time for questions and answers. So if they would like, please use the Zoom function for typing your question. But uh, very good insight, Larry. So I'm going to kind of switch, a bit switching between you and Ellen. So now I'm going to Ellen and uh, a little bit more specific for the, you know, board of directors. So Ellen, what steps should board directors take to ensure that there is positive motivational culture in a corporation? And I so think we might have to move to slides. I'm, I, I don't know do. if maybe one or maybe you, Ellen, will have to share them. I don't know if it would work that we see ourselves in, in the panel. So sorry I about that, have, but. <laughs> I don't have the slide. Oh, and, uh, okay. Um, it is the slide that says recommendations yes. from the ACD. So. so It'd be great if it let me see. Stay. Yes, either and I do have the presentation, but anyway, let's. All I'm right. sorry, but we, let's let's keep going then. All right. Well, hopefully you'll find the slide mm -hmm. eventually. Um, so let me step back and talk about one of the things that NAC did. NACD National Association of Corporate Directors did was they did this incredible study on culture as a corporate asset. It was uh, one of their every year they do a blue ribbon commission report on a particular topic and culture the conclusion throughout NACD um, has been and through uh, most of the directors that I know who sit on public companies and private companies for that matter is how impo important the culture is for a company in the long run short run and long run but certainly if you want to be around there for a long time it is absolutely critical and so out of this report came some recommendations from NACD that hopefully we're going to share soon. But in the meantime, let me talk to you about what they referred to in this Blue Ribbon Commission report as the seven essential dimensions of a successful culture. And they're, the seven, the seven essential dimensions of a successful culture, you're going to find there's a lot of overlap with the recommendations from NACD. So the first of a successful culture is performance orientation. Oh no, leave that slide up. Um, it, it's one, seven, seven 
essential dimensions of successful cultures. The first is performance orientation. Set high expectations for performance and holding people accountable for their actions and results. So to have a positive culture, you don't just have to have people do willy nilly what there is, but make sure each individual knows what is expected of them and that they are expected to be accountable for their results. Um, and obviously, as Larry said, there's a difference between something that gets you fired and something that you're just not performing and maybe you need to do differently. But the point is each individual has um, set high expectations and make sure people understand what their um, uh, actions and results are expected. Two, ethics and integrity. Make sure that the foundational value dimension, integrity, is, is, is really there underscored. Integrity implies a consistency between word and deed. And so it goes beyond financial integrity. So I'm not just talking about the numbers. It comes back to that whole conversation of if, if, if the leadership says we believe in X and we value X, I mean, does it act like that? Is that really what the actions demonstrate? And it's very important to think in terms of both ethics and integrity, because again, integrity is the consistency between words and deeds. Third, customer and quality focus. Do we really, does the organization really understand the value and the responsibility towards the customer and towards quality? Four, collaboration and trust. You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, collaboration is sort of embedded in a lot of conversations about culture because there are cultures, not this one, the one before it. Somebody switched slides on me. Um, it's this slide. Thank you very much. Um, collaboration is really critical because most people don't even talk about it um, because some companies, even though they say they have a great culture um, and they say they want a great culture, uh, make employees think that the person A has, if person A wins, person B loses. And the truth of the matter is, is that the most successful corporations are ones where people understand they need to communicate and they need to collaborate. Five, agility, innovation, and growth. It's a continual learning focus, right? It's a continual learning. Six, positive spirit and vitality. So it's again, comes back to collaboration, it comes back to teamwork, it comes back to being pride in the organization, and not least of which is appreciation and recognition. Now you see that here on this recommendation from ACD. All of these are built in, all the seven essential dimensions are actually inside the bullets in front of you, but appreciation and recognition is one that's really tricky to get right. I mean, I've seen this done wrong so many times and it's hard because on the one hand, people need to feel appreciated and it doesn't, isn't always about money. It can be, um, you know, thanking somebody at a company meeting for having done something special or done, you know, an extra job on something. Um, on the other hand, if your financial rewards point people to the only thing that's good is hitting the number for the quarter, then you're going to, you could, are potentially going to have bad behaviors. So it's really important, and you can see this throughout, and you'll hear me talk about it throughout, that the reward systems have to be aligned with the culture that you are trying to achieve, that you want, that you believe in. And that includes all the elements on this page. First, you have to be clear about it. You have to be proactive. You have to make sure you understand what the culture is at all levels of the company. Make sure culture is in, in, included, integrated in the business. It's not separate. It's part of it. The expectations we talked about, by the way, if your CEO isn't demonstrating it, then you're lost to start with. It comes back to tone at the top. And we talked about the reward system. So all these recommendations from NAC, they're so critical and they were so spot on. I just thought I needed to share them with everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to switch slightly uh, the focus for I have 
two more questions, actually one more question for each of you, and then we will open it up for, for the audience's uh, questions. So let me go back now to Larry and uh, talk about another topic that is important. So your book quotes that it is important for companies to think about how they respond to transgressions. Can you highlight the key items that everyone should think about on this? Yes, it is a very important question. And, and but before I dive into it, may I just say, I think what, the remarks that Ellen just made are, are, are so profoundly important. That her review of the NACD's research uh, was, was spot on. And, and that research document is just one of, the, one of the terrific publications. As she said, they do a blue ribbon report every, about every year and they're all always good. That one on corporate culture, I, I think is particularly valuable. Yeah. Uh, and on this question of responding, I, I like to quote uh, a member of the Berkshire Hathaway board, who is also chair of their audit committee. His name is Ron Olson. He's also an attorney uh, at, at Munger, Tolls, and, and Olson. He says the right way to respond to any corporate crisis is to get it out, get it right, and get it over. And yeah. what he's saying is you got to own it. It happened, you need to report it, disclose it, tell everybody, conduct an internal investigation, fix the problems, and move on. Uh, so that kind of uh, uh, self-commitment. Uh, and I'll give you an example of it. Uh, and, and it's an extraordinary uh, story at Berkshire Hathaway. In 2013, Warren asked David Sokol, who was then CEO of one of their big subsidiaries and widely reported to be Warren's handpicked successor. Warren asked David to scout for an investment in the industrial lubricants business. Now, David retained Citibank to scout for such an acquisition, which is very unusual at, at Berkshire. They don't usually hire banks to do their digging. They don't trust banks. Warren doesn't trust them. Um, but Citi came up with one, a company called Lubrizol, and David met with the CEO, David Sokol met with the CEO and, and made a preliminary uh, deal of sorts uh, and uh, reported to Warren that he's found a company, has terms that'll work, and he ought to take a look at it. And Warren said, okay, I will. And Warren took a look at it. Uh, and Warren said, yes, let's do this. And they signed up the deal and it went public, a uh, press release was issued, and a guy from Citi called Warren to say congratulations and we're delighted that we had a a role to play. Warren kind of scratched his head and said, what do you mean you had a role to play? Oh yeah, David hired us. Really? I didn't know that. So Warren called David and said, well, you didn't tell me you hired City. Um, and that's odd. That's not how we do things. Why wouldn't you tell me? Is there anything else you didn't tell me? David said, well, oh, one other thing I might have not told you is I bought $3 million worth of that stock uh, before I uh, presented it to you, before we did it. And that was a real head scratcher because that uh, sounds like a potential violation of federal securities laws. In, insider trading rules prohibit mm -hmm. insiders with material information from buying the stock of a, of a public company. And so that really bothered Warren, bothered him so much. Uh, he, he shared that with his uh, team. And they said, you know, that's, that's a problem. Uh, even if it's not a federal securities law violation, it violates Berkshire policy. We don't let our managers trade on companies we might invest in. Uh, and so with, with some difficulty, because Warren loved David, he was his handpicked successor, uh, Warren sat down and said, David, you know, you need to resign over this. We, we can't have this. I'm, I'm, you know, you should have told me and, and you shouldn't have done it, et cetera. And so they worked out a resignation and uh, Warren drafted a press release and issued it. His stockholders went nuts. Uh, and in the in the press release, besides just saying David did did this and we think it was wrong and David's resigning, Warren went on to praise David for all his great contributions to Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway stockholders and employees and the other executives went nuts. They they said this is a profound breach of trust. This hurts Berkshire's mm -hmm. reputation. I, I don't care if it's a a mild thing, maybe a violation, maybe not a violation of either federal law or, or company policy, uh, it, it's a stain and not something we should condone. Uh, and this was this episode occurred a couple of weeks before the annual meeting. So Warren turned it over to his board with Ron Olson 
in charge of that audit committee. Uh, and they then turned around and did what Ron always said to do. <laughs> so they developed a, a full factual report with every detail in it. And it was a pretty serious indictment of David. It, it didn't say he violated federal law, but he absolutely and clearly violated Berkshire policy. And they said, rather than having him resign, under his contract, he'd get lots of pay, compensation and so on. They fired him with cause uh, and threw him under the bus, excoriated him, publicly destroyed his business reputation. You know, he went from this pinnacle of Warren's successor to uh, former Berkshire executive. Uh, and my lesson, my takeaway, two, two takeaways from that uh, is go back to what Warren said to, Sol to the Congress around Solomon Brothers. Lose money for the firm, I'll be understanding. Lose reputation, even a shred of reputation, and I'll be ruthless. Well, what they did to David was ruthless. It, they lost a shred of reputation. The, the, the federal securities authorities, incidentally, dropped, they did an investigation and they dropped the case. Whether that exonerated David or not, uh, it was a relatively modest infraction. An infraction, but a relatively modest one. But it lost a shred of reputation. And so they had to be ruthless. And it, uh, the, the, the four cause termination, the public humiliation uh, was such a ruthless uh, response. So that, that's point one. The second point was that it was stunning to me and to others how Warren missed that. And he was gonna give David a slap on the wrist. You have to resign, and I'm, but I'm gonna praise you in the press release. That's not Berkshire culture. That's not the margin of trust. But what was valuable about it is that it, you didn't need Warren. His board of directors, Berkshire board and its audit committee and, 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 um, and, and Ron Olson vindicated that idea that this is a trust-based environment. You tell the truth, uh, you tell the whole truth. So <laughs> if you use City to find this deal, you tell me. If you bought stock in this, you better tell me. And if you don't do those things, you're out. So that's my answer, Dina. If, if, mm -hmm. if you want to build a trust-based culture, then violations, even modest violations, should be dealt with ruthlessly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your story highlights that perfectly. And well, this leads me to sort of my last prepared question for, for Ellen before we open it up for the audience's questions. So, and very importantly, I think this is a perfect transition because my last question for Ellen is, what qualities in board directors are important? why does NACD focus on culture as a corporate asset? And I think we have a, your slide, right, Ellen? One last There's one. There's a slide that says yes, the last questions one. to ask mm -hmm. before you join a board as a director. Mm -hmm. That's what the slide should say. Mm -hmm. so, so while you're getting that up, let me step back and say that um, I agree with everything Larry just said. Boy, mm -hmm. 110%. Um, I've sat on public boards since 2003, and boy, it, it is about your reputation. It's about the company. It's how you interact. So when you think about expectations, qualities of a director, so we got to come back to the role of the director, the fiduciary roles, um, the need for oversight, the need to make quality decisions and decisions that are in the best interests of the company. Um, I, I know it's a, I know we always talk about margin of trust, and I love that uh, title for Larry's book. Um, but sometimes it's trust but verify. And uh, I hate to use that expression, but if you're sitting at the board level, you know you need to trust, and the trust has to be there. But the way the 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 rules are set up, if you will, there also needs to be an appropriate level of verification in there too. So when you think about valued behaviors for directors, I mean, a lot of it, it, it's, it really does start with the values and the culture. It's the values, but the culture is the how. Um, you know, one of the challenges the board members have is, is that how do they know what they don't know? And so we come back to the qualities of the board director and they need to know how to ask questions appropriately. They're not management. The board director should never confuse themselves with management, but they need to know how to ask questions. They need to know how to engage. They need to know how to probe, if you will, to understand the mission and strategy, to probe operations appropriately. 
to make sure that all stakeholder relations, whether it's the shareholders, customers, employees, are being well thought out and they're being valued. They need to be able to listen and think in terms of consider what's best for, for all the stakeholders. Um, and so when you think in terms of, and you'll see I've got prioritization of quality and safety on there, and a recognition that global differences are real. So um, if somebody, but it always comes down to the values and ethics, ethics and integrity. But having said that, um, that doesn't mean that you know, you need to think in terms of how different a global company is and understanding of those cultures that those people live in. Um, there are always a black and white spot. There's always a spot where it's black and white. And I agree with Larry. I mean, if somebody's in the black spot, it is, you know, you cut them off. I hate to say cut them off at their knees, could be ruthless, whatever the right answer is. But you need to be able to demonstrate that you really take actions. So if you're going to join a board, or in this case, a, I'll call it a public company board, I think what's really important is to understand how the board communicates, how they really ask questions, how they really understand the culture of a company and the value system that it has, um, how they communicate with each other, how they communicate with management, and frankly, how do they respond when there's a problem? Um, you just can tell a lot about people. There's always going to be problems. Companies go through um, peaks and valleys. They go through issues. There's, there, you're going to have an issue at some point. So the question is, how can the board members work together? How can the board members work positively um, between with management? So one of the questions I would put out there for people to think about, excuse me, is it's important for board members to get to know different levels of an organization. And there are ways to do that without uh, becoming management. So you're still a director, you are not management. And so some of the best practices I'd like to share that I've seen are uh, come from some of the different boards I've sat on it. One board, um, this was American Power Conversion, each board member was actually assigned a different manager that they were supposed to get to know. They were supposed to talk to once every couple months, maybe have coffee with them when they were in town, um, but they need to get to know them. And they got to know people in their, that they wouldn't normally be interacting. So for example, I often chair the audit committee. So I was aligned with sales at one point and another point with the head of manufacturing. You know, I talk to the CFO all the time, so didn't need to have that one. That relationship or existed. But you, this kept moving around so that every year a person would be shifted so that members of management would get to know different members of the board and different members of board would know different members of management that they wouldn't normally deal with. And so people got to know each other. It comes back to trust, right? I mean, the better you know, the better you can communicate it builds a level of understanding and awareness how, how each other communicates. So that's one. Two, how, do you, how is interaction with customers done? When was the last time the board ever interacted with the customer? I mean, one of my companies, I'm actually on the board of the largest uh, aluminum alloy wheel maker in the world. And so about a year ago, as an example, before the pandemic, um, we walked the plant um, of one of our largest customers, global um, automotive manufacturers, and watched the wheels go through the different lines, um, how they were put on, spent a lot of time with some of the different senior execs from that automotive manufacturer, the C-suite. Um, and so how does the board really get information on relationships with customers, interface with customers, understand their issues. And sometimes what companies will do is they'll have their board members go to industry trade shows or conferences or other things 
but you just need to make sure that there is a connection. And then of course, there's always, how do you stay focused in on not just the employees, not just the customers, but also obviously the shareholders. Um, the whole point here is to build open discussion lines so that if there's an issue, you can make sure that you have full information and there can be appropriate discussion. So with that, I'll leave that. All right, well, thank you very much to both of you. Um, we're, we actually have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna, from the audience, which is great. And unfortunately, as always, you know, kind of running short on time. So I'm gonna pass this on to Max, uh, Max Latona, and um, he will kind of give you um, the questions from the audience. All right, I think Max is with yeah. us here. Right. Thank you, Dina. And thank you, sure. Ellen and Larry, for your remarks. Very interesting and insightful. So we have a number of good questions. The first concerns Wells Fargo. I think um, this uh, uh, attendee would like you to evaluate what happened with Wells Fargo in light of some of your comments today. Uh, he or she says, Wells Fargo had incentive issues. Does this relate to corporate culture, governance, reputation risk, and or stewardship of shareholders' long-term capital? Um, in general, how would you evaluate what happened at Wells Fargo? So, Larry, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? You're welcome to go, Alan. So, I love that question. The answer is yes, 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 and yes. Um, you know, is there, does it relate to corporate culture? Absolutely. Governance? Absolutely. Reputation risk? Absolutely. Stewardship of long-term capital? Absolutely. But I think it does start. I think, I think it comes back to, remember I kept saying, understand your, your culture, your values in your culture, ethics, integrity. And I said, remember, make sure the reward system is aligned with it. And in this case, the, I would say it failed. It failed spectacularly. And the interesting thing, the worst thing of it, not only was it, it failed, it failed. And I suspect some people in the organization didn't understand. Literally, it was an ignorance thing, or maybe I shouldn't use that word. But it, it, it failed dramatically because people didn't understand that it was driving certain behaviors. Then you could argue on the other side it was so, when you really sat back and evaluated what was happening, why didn't more people raise their hand and say, uh, should we be doing this? Is this right? Why, why is this? Now, we don't know if that happened, right? We actually don't know that. So it is possible that some people did try to raise their hands, but it's clear that it took it a whole long, t much more longer time than it should have to, to be stopped. So it failed spectacularly. It's an example of um, alignment systems driving behaviors that should never have occurred. And it, it's a reputational disaster. It was a cultural disaster. It was an integrity issue. So. Thank you, Ellen. Larry. Larry, do you have uh, any additional comments? Very little to add. I agree entirely with what Ellen said. All of the above is the correct answer to the uh, uh, attendee's question. Uh, quote, uh, a famous adage uttered by Charlie Munger, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. He said, show me the compensation system and I will predict behavior. And yeah. Uh, yeah. fundamental, right? And we, yeah, that's a good board function too in terms of how CEOs behave. Um, and I guess my third comment is the very uncomfortable one about how that, the, the damage at, Bert, at Wells Fargo, how did that reflect on Berkshire Hathaway, which um, is a very large shareholder of, of Wells Fargo, certainly the largest one. Uh, and for decades, uh, Buffett had extolled its virtues and its leadership and so on. So it was a huge uh, bruise uh, for him personally, and I, and I think in some ways for Berkshire, uh, critics like to pounce on uh, perceived hypocrisy and so on. Uh, my own uh, I'm discomforted by the whole thing, but I, my own logic around it is that there is a difference between uh, Berkshire's investees and its its scope of responsibility for them and its wholly owned subsidiaries. Um, it, yeah. it has absolute and total responsibility for its own companies and calls shots. It ultimately, it was ultimately responsible, even in the delegated uh, culture. 
Uh, but it really, it doesn't, it's not able to shape the culture of all of its investees, even if it, even if it would like to. Um, uh, but it is a pity that that doesn't, that doesn't work, or at least it didn't in that case. Great, thank you. Um, we have another good question from Helen. She directs this to you, Larry. She says, Larry, what was it that drew you to Berkshire Hathaway as an example of a culture of trust? And additionally, how would you have told Warren to react to David's indiscretion in uh, the resignation letter? So what drew you to Berkshire Hathaway in the first place and how would you have advised uh, Warren Buffett in that incident? Thanks, Helen. I, I was drawn to Berkshire back in the 90s, mainly because the somewhat unconventional philosophy uh, really appealed to me. Uh, it's an uh, unorthodox approach. Uh, I, was, I was a bit skeptical by nature uh, about um, can, you know, received wisdom in, in, in a lot of different ways, especially around how markets work, how governance ought to work. And so that, that's what drew me to it initially. And I found over the 25 years it to be a wonderful community. I mean, it's, there's a culture at Berkshire Hathaway as a company, and then there's a whole culture around the shareholder base and, and, and people who, who read and understand and, and, and study the philosophy. So I just, I regard the, the whole experience and the, the, the culture and subculture to be uh, just very congenial. Um, and uh, if Warren asked me, um, I hope I would have had the guts and, and fortitude and skill to do what Ron Olson uh, did. I, I think it was the right answer. Um, um, I, I can't say if I would have done. Uh, if Warren calls me and says, so here's what I'm thinking about doing. What do you think? Uh, I'd like to be able to say, well, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I, I can't say for sure. Um, he undoubtedly talked to a couple other people and they did not dissuade him. So, um, but I think Ron was exactly right. I, I think it's a shame. Uh, and I've, I've got to know David later on. He, he's, he's, he's not a terrible person. He's a nice person, a good businessman. So, so it, was a, it was a ruthless reaction, but I do think it was the right one. Great. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ted. Uh, he writes, and, and this is more of a comment to uh, the Berkshire termination story and to Ellen's conflict resolution comments. He says that my big learning about the quality of a CEO and a board is when they will terminate, quote unquote, one of their guys or gals. Bad behavior is typically obvious to the staff, uh, whether executive level or team level. So it goes to the CEO and the board to set that tone, which then trickles down to the teams and the teams that, uh, that lead can and they should terminate uh, bad behavior. So I guess it's a question about... Um, I guess maybe more generally, the CEO versus the board and setting the tone of the company. And when when can you see them actually doing that? Um, so well, any, any thoughts about that? Maybe Ellen, we'll start with you. Well, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, um, over 17 years of being a public company board director, a number of my CEOs have been fired. Some have been sort of resigned or retired or whatever you want to call it. And some have been outright fired, but it's usually because um, they behaved in a way or did not hit. It's rarely because they didn't just hit the numbers because it comes back to if you deliver bad news and you work to figure out a resolution of it, um, boards, will tend to want to work with somebody that they trust, right? Um, but if you hold back information, a couple of the situations where CEO was essentially holding back information, um, you know, the board has to take actions, right? They don't have a choice. And sometimes they wait too long. Um, sometimes it's a black and white situation like, you know, we've, we've talked about. Um, um, I, I've been lucky enough, I haven't seen any sort of um, uh, situations like some, some friends have been through um, where the CEO spectacularly did something very, very bad and had to be basically walked out the same day. I have seen a number of situations where the CEO decided to act like a, 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 his version of a dictator and the board meetings were controlled, the information flow to the board was controlled, things weren't transparent. And by the time the board sorted that out, which isn't always fast, sometimes slower than you'd like, you have to take action. So it does start with the tone at to the top, it starts with the board and the boards I've been with 
have not been shy about taking action, but sometimes they had to work through where the real source of the act, the issue was, because you don't always know whether it's the CEO or if it's a member of his team. And I've got, I've got a few yellow and red flags. If if we have time at the end, I can come back to that, because there are some yellow and red flags that I've learned over time that board members should watch for. Unfortunately, having lived through this. Well, actually, we'd love to hear about that. So maybe we'll give Larry a chance at this question and then maybe go back to you, Ellen, for a few of those. If we have time. Yeah, I think, uh, once again, Ellen is entirely right. I, I'll just add, I think the most important job a board of directors has is selecting the CEO. Uh, and if they've done that job well, if they get an outstanding CEO, they will have very few other problems. Uh, the second most important job is replacing that person when yeah. the uh, <laughs> reasons like Ellen suggest. Uh, and she's done it. It's doable. It happens, uh, unfortunately, with some, some frequency. Uh, at the level of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the next rung down, I mean, a delegated, uh, autonomous, decentralized culture like Danaher, Berkshire, Johnson & Johnson, they're, they're CEOs of the operating companies. Uh, under what circumstances and in what manner does the uh, the head of the um, operating, the uh, holding company, terminate uh, those people? And fortunately, at both Berkshire uh, and Danaher, th that kind of firing has been rare. In Berkshire's case, he's hired 150 or so CEOs of those operating companies that I that I showed you on that on that decentralized grid, and he's only had to fire about 15. That, that's pretty low, uh, and, and uh, he, he didn't want to fire any of them. He's he warned is constitutionally opposed to friction and conflict, so it's not a fun job that he has. But he'll fire him for some very fundamental trust-oriented reason. I'll just give you one quick example. When he acquired Benjamin Moore Paints in 2000, he made a personal commitment that to all the distributors. That, that's a company that sells its paint through mom and pop stores, small network of distributors around the country, rather than through the big top retailers uh, like Home Depot. Uh, and they were nervous, uh, those distributors, that this acquisition would, would hurt hurt their business. And he made a personal promise that they would not do that. They would not sell through Home Depot and the, the other the other big ones. Uh, and uh, two, then over the next eight or 12 years, doing that proved competitively extremely difficult. So CEOs, an incumbent CEO decided he was going to change that. And Warren went nuts. <laughs> that time made a personal problem. I know it's a difficult thing, but you've got to solve that some other way. And, um, uh, and he wouldn't do it, so he fired him. And that happened to two CEOs in a row. He finally found a third one who would uh, honor or help honor Warren's promise. Now, it's another question whether Warren should have been making business promises like that. But once the promise is made, uh, the CEOs have to, have to live with them. And if they, if they can or don't, then they need to be fired. Great. Uh, so we, we only have time for maybe one or two more questions uh, since it's two o'clock now. So we have a question from Barry, um, and this is directed to Ellen. Ellen, what do you believe are the appropriate metrics for determining fair compensation to directors? Wow. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, that's a controversial topic, isn't it? Um, I'll jump in and say, I'm, I'm glad that, that the hard questions are for Ellen, the easy ones are for me. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, well, it's an interesting question because, um, you know, there's a traditional way of doing it, which is, of course, uh, understanding what other companies pay. But that's, you know, then that just ratchets things up. Um, I think the answer is... Um, a real mixed answer um, because you need to not only know what the mark what the market is but also what the real job is um, and what the company appropriately should be spending and so for example the if, if the right number is X to put it in generically in the market well, maybe the company is in a turnaround situation and maybe more of that needs to be in stock so that you're more closely aligned with all the shareholders. So, you know, the proportions of stock and cash. I'm not going at this very well because it is, it is a, that's a three-week answer on compensation. But 
there are people who evaluate. We certainly get a lot of external data. All my companies in comp um, get a lot of external data, look at what other companies like us are doing. And the like us is not just market cap. It's not just revenue size. It's also the type of business we are. It's the stage the business is in. And it's what is an appropriate spend versus, you know, what we spend on management, given the requirements of management, because you certainly don't want the board to be being paid out of the out of the ballpark. I mean, management's the one who's really running the company on a day-to-day -day basis. So all those factors need to be taken into account. That's not a very good answer, I know. No, it's complex. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Um, there is a question from Karen I think is excellent. Um, given the uh, oversight role that you both have described uh, about the, the, uh, the board over the CEO, is there a problem when the CEO is also the chairman of the board? Do you think that that's an acceptable state of affairs or is there red flags and issues with that? What, do you, what would you say about that? Larry, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm happy to go first on that one. I, I, I think it depends. I, I have uh, written on this uh, and I, I'm very skeptical that a one size fits all rule works here. I, I get that it, what it achieves to, to separate those functions is it, dis, it, it distributes power into two different centers and, and provides uh, a nice balance and vindicates the idea that the board's job is to over, oversee and hire and fire the CEO and in a way that if, if that fellow, that gal is, is the same person, it, it may complicate that. I get all that and so I can see reasons why you do it. But there are a very large number of cases where the, the value of that person as an executive, as a strategist, as a, as a visionary, uh, makes, it, it makes it work for the corporation uh, and for the shareholders, for that fellow or gal uh, to be the same person. So uh, I would uh, support or oppose a resolution of that sort depending on who that person is, what the company is, is up to, what the track record is. Uh, and and vote vote on that basis rather than have and I, my I, my general preference is for contextual governance guidelines rather than one size fits all. Thank you, Ellen. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I'm a variation on a theme. So I think you know the problem is is that you know companies are where they are, and um, I one I agree not one size fits all. Two, you can make either side work. Right. Some of it depends on if you have if your CEO is also chairman of the board, do you have a very strong lead independent director? And if you do, OK, I've seen that work extremely well. Um, the biggest time you have is to, to to separate them, which philosophically, I think it's better to be separated. But you know, I also agree with Larry. I mean, if you got a great guy and he happens to have the title of a chairman, you're not going to strip it away from him. I mean, that would be like, in, to me, that would be insane. I call it insanity run amok. Um, but having said that, if you were starting up a company for the first time and you had the ability to keep them separate, absolutely. Let's have a chairman separate than the CEO. Why not? Um, but once you're already there with the CEO having the chairman title, just make sure you have a strong lead independent director who can make sure that the right governance things and the right independence and the right actions are taken, and then you can make it work. Not one size fits all, exactly like Larry said. Okay. We lose Max? No. I don't know. I think Max froze. I think Max froze. Uh -huh. Okay. We had a big rain right now. <laughs> oh, really? Max has disappeared. I think I think something happened to his connection. Must have, yeah. So, well, um, I, he is supposed to do the closing remarks, uh, but if he doesn't basically come back, I think we had one last slide, sort of the, the closing remarks, but we're right over time. And so if 
if I, I actually don't see him. So I would really like to thank you both. Hopefully he's back. Yeah, he lost his connection. I just got a text. So thank you everyone. Thank you everyone in the audience for your questions and for being with us. And especially I want to thank Ellen and Larry for your time and for your expertise, for sharing all that with us today. And please be sure, you know, we, we to keep an eye on the CEBG because we are having, you know, all these virtual webinars and, and hosting them. So you'll be hearing more from us. Um, so thank you again and have a good afternoon. Um, we, we conclude this today like this. Thank you very much again. Bye. Thank you.